Welcome back to Behind the Bastards, the podcast where, once again, Miles and I are talking about the well-known fact that I'm a much better basketball player than LeBron James. Sophie? <laughs> yeah. How we doing? Y- you're not, but I like your enthusiasm. I, uh, LeBron has never done the, the five-pointer shots that I make all the time. No, definitely not. That's definitely not. That's when you do and it as backwards. You say, his, his jump shot is not wetty like yours. No, wetty. Thank you. That's exactly the slang that I know what means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's so funny how stupid you sound. It's so funny. <laughs> you know what else is funny, Sophie? I was going to say something really mean and then I stopped myself. What? Wow. Well, you know what I did is I spent time, because I'm not a mean person like you, reading from the Bible, you know the good book, which we're all supposed to do every day. And I found a relevant quote from the Bible. And? Uh, I'm just going to read this bit of Mark 37, 16, because I think we all... Oh, I thought you were going to read from Playboy magazine, August of 1982. (laughs) That's somebody's Bible. (laughs) No, I I, I think we could use a little bit more religion on this podcast. And uh, and so I'm going to read this this, this verse from the Bible. Save us, Robert. Cherish ye. All the catalytic converters that mm. that frolic and frock in the streets around you, mm. and never let them stay in the car with which they were initially assembled. And instead, take for ye all the precious metals they contain, and use them to buy street drugs oh. under bridges. Mm-hmm. That's. I mean, let's just bring it down one more time. Deuteronomy mm. eight eighteen. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. But remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth through the theft of catalytic converters. Wow. Wow. Which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. I mean, this is why the Bible is, this is why I want to get this shit tatted sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone disagreeing with that. (laughs) This is not funny, Sophie. This is is my religion, Sophie. Don't. Don't play with Miles, God. I think we might have to get HR involved because if I remember the classes that I did not take, that <laughs> HR makes us take. Yeah, you're we are not allowed to demean a coworker's religion. I guarantee you're still getting emails <laughs> about that. I have not checked those emails in months, Sophie. Um, so, Miles, mm. we're back talking yes. about Clarence Thomas. What's a good nickname for Clarence Thomas? Uh, hmm. I feel like it's some kind of like a good nickname is some kind of Marvel supervillain that involves like some kind of porn pun. Yeah, definitely. There has to be like something pornographic there, which he would appreciate personally as someone who uncontrollably talks about pornography to every single person that he yeah. gets to know for more than 35 seconds. I'm trying to think, is there any, I mean, there's pyro and that could just be porno, but that's not like very clever. Um, We'll think about that. I mean, I yeah, think, we'll I, think I'll challenge that. the listeners for that. Yeah, something we'll good. About that. Something good. I was gonna go with Lex Luthor, but mainly because I think Clarence Tom. Well, is he bald? Am I just imagining that Clarence Thomas? No, he is got bald? hair. He's got a little hair. Yeah, he's got hair. Let me let me, let me take a look. Let me take a look. I think it's haloing. Uh, now, but... yeah, it is haloing. But no, you're right. He has that like it's like a crown of white hairs too. So like, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. He's got a little wrong. vaporized spider webs. Bald? Um, I don't know, but. Uh, oh, oh yeah, no, that's because in the most yeah. recent pictures, he's like barely has any left. I okay, guess he's kind of like, he's like Smeagol, you know, in that like porno has ruined him. Like I see like the ring of power, the ring of porno that he's pursuing. And then I just think yeah. of how his, the walls are plastered with porno. Yeah. It's like Smeagol when he has the ring. He's like, ah! <laughs> I, I look forward to the day when Elijah Wood attempts to to throw his his old playboys into a volcano, <laughs> but but can't bear to do it. And then Clarence Thomas tackles them out of his hands and falls into the mouth to, of I to don't know save them some the fires of Mount Doom. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, big on Tolkien today. <laughs> um. So. Yeah, the uh, we're talking a bit about Clarence Thomas, who is, as we start this story, about to be the Republican nominee, the latest of like way too many fucking Supreme. They make they nominate so many fucking Supreme Court justices in the Reagan Bush years. It is mm-hmm. heartbreaking. Um, 
And yeah, the kind of black conservatism that Thomas had come to support by the late 1980s was very formed by both his experiences at Yale with his racist white liberal colleagues and his experiences with racists in the Reagan administration. It was a better the devil you know kind of bargain mixed with an almost religious belief in the saving power of black men and the focus on a kind of family values that hinged around an authoritarian, all-powerful father exerting iron control over his family. That's what... Like his kind of attitude comes around as is like you can't you can't understand or stop racism. It's useless to try. You'll just wind up making the problem worse. All you can do is empower black men to have complete control over their families in order to like protect and direct them. Um, the state will do nothing but get in the way of black self-reliance. And in Thomas's evolving view, things like affirmative action only stripped black men of self-respect while integration broke up strong black communities. The fact that Thomas himself had repeatedly benefited from affirmative action programs uh, does not seem to have had an impact on his beliefs here, um, although he was constantly angry about that. So I don't know. That's a complicated thing to wrap your head around, I guess. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. The levels of. I mean, that's again, we, there's so much that's like confounding about him, but so much that makes sense. That makes too. sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, that, that is like a, a whole thing to, to, to get your head around. And it is like, I think rightfully so it, there's nothing unreasonable or hard to understand about being like angry about the existence of affirmative action because of like what it implies. Mm hmm. Right. What it implies about like the past of the country that you're in. Right. Right. I don't think it's reasonable to be against those programs, but I think it's reasonable to be like it's fucked up that like this is necessary um, mm -hmm. and that it's going to lead to people treating black people who benefit from these programs differently as if like they don't deserve to be there. Like that is a, like, right. fucked up and a problem. It doesn't mean that like the solution is do nothing. Um, exactly. It's right. Which is like yeah. he says, or you're just going to make the problems of racism worse. Yeah. Well, it's not like you want to put out a fire, right? And he's right. just saying, don't fan the flames. And it's like, no, extinguish the fire. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's fucked up. We got to have so many firefighters out of this fire. But yeah, it is. It's bad that the fire got that bad. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the solution is fewer firefighters. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> or you can fan the flames. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so according to Corey Robin, quote, among the few to have noticed this at the time of his nomination was the right-wing intellectual Murray Rothbard. Before he died in 1995, Rothbard came to a late-life vision of a coalition of libertarians and white nationalists. Forging alliances with Pat Buchanan and Ron Paul, Rothbard anticipated the merger of America's two great manias, racism and capital or in capitalism, that are the hallmark of the Trump regime. Black separatism or black nationalism, Rothbard said of Thomas's philosophy, has long struck me as more, far more compatible with human nature, as well as far more libertarian, than the compulsory integration beloved of left liberalism. A modern, updated version of the black nation idea, Rothbard added, would set the American blacks free at last, free from what they see as white racism and what many whites see as parasitism over the white populace through crime or welfare payments. In independent at long last, liberated from what they see as the institutionalized legacy of slavery, the blacks would finally be free to find their own level. So, like, Rothbard sucks. Rothbard, by the way, is the reason why libertarian is a right-wing word now. That's like a right. conscious thing that he did is steal it from the left. And is a, just a mass... As, as that makes clear, that's a massive racist talking, right? Like, everything about 100%. that is very racist. Yeah. Um, Again, but also... Just give them their own thing. Give, let them just do their own thing yeah. like over there, man. Also, though, you have to, like, again, this is the thing you c c you always have to say about Rothbard, a very intelligent man who was good at getting what he wanted. Because, mm -hmm. like, this is a winning strategy. Not with most people, but, like, with enough that it's come to dominate a huge chunk of Republican politics um, and been a significant part in a couple of presidential elections. So, yeah, and it and it also congrats, gives, Murray. like, a great new feeling or vibe to the idea of like not wanting to help like yeah. marginalized people, which is, you know, people should just be kind of like left to do their own thing is sort of what I'm saying. Like, I'm not trying to say they deserve that, but what I'm saying is my belief is that like people should just be free to like sort that out. Like if it's not working for them, then like they should work that out. And is that sort of like this other, you know, form of, uh, neglectful racism that uh, people love yep um it's pretty good it, it, it's it's uh yeah 
In June of 1991, Thurgood Marshall announced his retirement from the Supreme Court. Tragically, uh, if he'd held on a little bit longer, his successor might have been someone who was a little bit more to the left, uh, and they would have been appointed by President Clinton. Um, but at the time, June of 1991, you got to remember, Bush looked like he was going to win, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was, it, it, you know, things were going pretty good. He had a, uh, he'd, he'd had a, a he, he was in the process, I guess, of having a fun little war, which we all had a really good time with, made everybody oh, feel good yeah. about themselves. Yeah. I mean, who didn't have those custom Ninja Turtles that were straight up, uh, desert storm propaganda. Man, he mm -hmm. should have gotten a second term just because of the Ninja Turtles. Just off the strength of the toys, yeah. Yeah, off the strength of the toys, absolutely. And the G.I. Joe episodes we got out of that period of time. Oh, Ooh. my God. What a what a great time that was for everyone. Yes, this scuds for you, Saddam. We should have done another couple of wars like that instead of the problem wars, right? Yeah, I know. Just you know? fuck a country up a little bit and then, like, bounce. Just a little That's... bit, though, you know? <laughs> Just, a, just, just fucking around, just a dude. Just for the weekend. But, yeah. What if we just bombed? I don't know. What's the capital of Poland? Poland town. What if we just bombed Poland town a little bit? You know, and then we bounce. And then we're gone, right? Just as a little <laughs> warning. Gone. Make us yeah. feel good. Hundred hours on the ground, right? Everybody, everybody feels like a not winner. even, not yeah. even. Yeah. Easy, simple. God, you wanna, what a you want to bomb Warsaw? Thank you, Sophie. Warsaw. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, join the great club of dudes who did that. If yeah, I know I one thing say, about, I was gonna say that's 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 <laughs> not Sophie, fair. If I know one thing about history, it's that bombing Warsaw is always a good guy move. <laughs> <laughs> I have no response to that. I'm just concerned uh, for you. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, anyway, stop borking around. Thank you, so. Oh, Thank wow. you for bringing it back to Robert Bork. So <laughs> you're borking your life up. <laughs> if if Thurgood Marshall had held on a little bit longer, another like year and change, he probably would have had his successor appointed by President Clinton. But like, and I, I'm not saying this to like criticize the man. Like, imagine yourself in his position. You've spent your entire life fighting for civil rights and doing so very effectively. You are old and sick and in pain. And you're pretty fucking sure this Bush guy's going to win re-election, right? Mm -hmm. So like, why continue to just sit there writing out dissent pieces while you're like kind of unable to function at your prior level yeah. you know especially like, when i'm like, not i'm not yeah especially when that like i'm doing the best i can with what i have quote like makes yeah. you sound like fucking hodor of like yeah it's just like just ripping up your body and you're like i'm trying y'all no, i am desperately trying but it's just they're not ripping my body apart yeah. like i i can't i have no I, I, no blame for him in this like but he does he does quit you know um wait where, where are those like white women who are bl blaming their good marshall they're like actually if you really follow this domino effect it's it was their good marshall's marshall. fart, fault um yeah i don't i don't i don't i don't particularly blame him he's in a, a pretty bad historic position here it is kind of tragic knowing that, like oh man you were about to get a moderately more progressive person in the white house uh right but tragically that did not happen um, so he 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 quits, you know, he does the old Irish goodbye uh, and and bounces. And um, yeah, now George H.W. Bush is going to is one of his last things as president, get to put another ass in a seat at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at this point, they can't throw another moderate in there. You know, Bush and John Sununu have like kind of edged the far right as much as they possibly can and they need to pick a judge that like the the fascist wing of the party complete, is going to get hard about. Yeah. yeah and and that 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 motherfucker is clarence thomas um mm. however the realities of the selection process mean that they also need to convince congress that he is not in fact a threat to abortion that is the primary concern when thomas gets nominated right um, mm -hmm. is that oh this guy's going to end roe v wade right that is the primary concern in 1991 um, this guy's in, gonna end Roe v. Wade. Now, so a lot of Congress people before approving him want to like know whether or not he's a threat to the right to choose. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not as simple as it sounds. Actually, finding out how he would rule on it because Thomas, again, as we've kind of walked through this, he has no history as a trial lawyer. He's never worked as a judge prior to this. Right. You know. Um, he has absolutely no history of ruling on or considering cases or being involved with cases that involve abortion. 
There's nothing to read on in his actual past here. And part of that is because, again, he's not a fucking judge. So there's like no way to look at how he's handled past cases here. He's like, what do you do, sir? How did how the fuck did your name get? Yeah, he's a political creature, right? Like he does not have and he is he's kind of deliberately avoided being in positions where there's a whole lot to criticize him on in in most of these actual like super dicey uh, uh, areas. Mm -hmm. Um, So when he undergoes his confirmation hearings, um, Thomas fights hard to be uh, to avoid being pinned down on the matter of whether or not he supports the right to choose. Um, he says at one point that he doesn't know how he's going to rule on abortion, right? Like, like, I don't know. I don't know what I do. I don't know what I do if that came up, you know? Um, quote, I hadn't read those cases about privacy and I hadn't thought much about substantive due process since law school. I had constitutional law in 1972. Roe was decided in 1973. So he's literally like, I just didn't think about it much. And no, it never like, occurred it to happened, me. Like, oh shit, that's right. But then like, I got out of law school. So yeah. I'm like, I wasn't really thinking about it. Yeah, I might think, I, I might say, not a law guy here, but I might say that not having thought about a major civil rights issue ever in your career might would preclude be, you. Yeah, maybe like you shouldn't be a judge of the, yeah. on the Supreme Court if you've like <laughs> I mean, never thought about this in your life. <laughs> that's what's wild too, is like, I'm sure there's like this perfect, again, because he's this political creature too, like he's benefited from just like patriarchy and that he can yeah. be like a guy who has really, he's replacing one of like, the most brilliant Supreme Court justices, with yeah. a dude who's never done shit like yeah, at that like legal level literally the no fucking goat. This guy who, by any standard, has had an incredible prior to becoming a Supreme Court justice, has an incredible legal career. Still to this day, <laughs> one of the most influential trial lawyers in the history of like Western law, and he gets replaced by a guy who, um, like had eight eight years as chairman of the EEOC and prior to that, like briefly represented Monsanto and then like, and then like nothing sent the record for talking about porn for like mostly just talks to porn in the office to his colleagues. Like what? So Thomas though, um, is really good. You know, obviously he has no real background as a, the kind of things you would want a Supreme court justice to have, but he has gotten really good at this point at using his personal background as someone who grew up poor and black to befuddle liter- liberals and kind of like, you know, push back on any sort of claims that he might not be a good fit as a Supreme court justice. Uh, he followed this statement, the one I just read about how he hasn't considered privacy law by claiming quote, I was more interested in the race issues. I was more interested in getting out of law school. I was more interested in passing the bar exam. My life was consumed by survival. I couldn't pay my rent. I couldn't repay my student loans. I had all these other things going on that you were navigating these worlds that you're navigating. So that's his like reason for why I didn't consider, I never considered abortion or privacy. I had real things to worry about. You know, I had, I, as a, as a, as a, as a poor black kid, I had like to actually fight to pay my rent. So I couldn't think about privacy rights or the right to choose. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And that like, it shuts down a lot of the criticisms against him in the Senate. Now, if you want a tremendously detailed look at how the confirmation process went or precisely why Thomas was picked, all of that stuff, I really do recommend the book Strange Justice by Meyer and Abramson. Um, I think it is important to note that Thomas really plays up the aspects of his background that sound good to liberals when he is during this confirmation process. Mm Because again, he spent years playing up aspects of his background to appeal to the right. And now that he's got to like appeal to the center at some point, he starts like really pushing the parts of him that do sound good to liberals. When he's asked what he minors in during college, he tells the Senate protest. Um, And it should be noted that many, many liberals at the time absolutely did not buy what what Thomas was trying to like get over on them. His far right views were well documented. His history, you know, we've talked about he gives all these speeches at the Heritage Foundation. That New York Times mm-hmm. article I quoted from earlier where he's like that's criticizing him for being friends with a bunch of apartheid people and participating in like pro apartheid like think tank uh, uh, events like that is known at the time. He's being criticized for that at the time. Um, And he also has a nasty history of statements about things like racial intermarriage and women's rights. Uh, There was extreme suspicion at the time that he would be a vote against reproductive choice on the Supreme Court. And many, many people did not fall for his act. And so his confirmation process was contentious and brutal. And some of the ugliest moments during it came to the during the testimony of a former female employee who had worked Worked with him at both the Department of Education and at the EEOC. And now it's time, Miles, mm. to talk about Anita Hill. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're not gonna nobody's nobody's gonna feel good about this this isn't what like a long fucking road to this point yeah. yeah this this is the road to anita hillville but you know what it's the road to first miles hmm products and services oh boy yeah this is you know this is a road that you can travel on your car when you replace your catalytic converter which by the way we're just gonna take again yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just, why that's winding up right in the pocket, baby, right in the pocket. You just at this point stop driving that Prius. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, no, you're Unless not getting you that back. You want to see us? You yeah. know what I mean. That's what yeah. I say. Look, man, you can wrap it in razor blades. I don't care. I got gloves. Like I'm we, we're used to shit this out. shit. Yeah, nobody. You know what kind you, of you fucking cannot valuable stop treasures us. are inside that thing. Mm-hmm. Gems, doubloons, <laughs> all for you there <laughs> inside a catalytic converter. <laughs> Could you? imagine that's like <laughs> it's all started as a myth from a pirate yeah, type guy I, i'm imagining redoing the opening of the first indiana jones and instead of that like little head statue it's like a catalytic converter sitting on the thing that he's gotta like saw out somebody somebody's parked their 2008 prius inside a mayan temple and he's just jacking <laughs> that thing oh yeah just yar there be many catalytic converters yonder and then you go we we there's rhodium and platinum mm -hmm. inside yeah in in the first pirates of the caribbean movie what's his name the 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 older pirate uh just like oh, yeah, opening up a chest rush one yeah jeffrey rush opening a chest and just like running catalytic converters falling out of his hand yeah. <laughs> washing his hand in it like it's a cool stream exactly he got the he has the fucking chain mm -hmm. necklace made of yeah. catalytic elizabeth's converters. got like a catalytic converter necklace and it falls into the ocean and that's what wakes up all of the skeleton <laughs> 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 oh my god that's merch man where mm -hmm. are the catalytic converter pirate chest set that's right baby here's some ads Uh, Miles, mm. we're back. Yep. We're back. We're talking about both catalytic converters and Clarence Thomas. Um, yeah, mostly catalytic converters over the last mm. minute or so. But, you know, I mm -hmm. think we can all agree much more relevant to civil rights law than than the Supreme Court is the catalytic converter. Look, I mean, look, we always say liberation <laughs> through catalytic conversion. That's a, that's exactly right. This is, Miles, the Supreme Court takes away rights at the drop of a hat you can't trust them you can't rely on them you can always mm -hmm. rely on a catalytic converter to be worth hard cash you know 100 percent. and look, absolutely if you saw this look folks and uh thanks so much for coming to this hilton for this talk but i gotta say <laughs> with the market price right now for metals like rhodium like palladium mm -hmm. like platinum okay we call those the big three in the mm -hmm. catalytic converter business the trio the has skyrocketed okay so we're talking i mean sir you can have a new boston whaler boat if you wanted within two months okay mm -hmm. just hard grab all right <laughs> just don't buy a new prius because we're getting that cat no we are don't, we no. are like popping said, that baby out of there <laughs> uh yeah you, you come in that prius then you're gonna see us mm -hmm. you know what I that's mean? right or you that's probably right. won't to that's... be honest we're a little more a <laughs> little more subtle uh so now it's time to talk about Anita Hill. This is not as fun as talking about what stealing catalytic converters. What a fucking transition. Yeah, what a, what a transition. So uh, there's a, a lot of ink has been spilled on the subject of Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. what he did, what he didn't do. The gist of it is this. Hill was a young black woman who had grown up in a poor but comfortable farming family in rural Oklahoma. Unlike Thomas, she benefited from a strong, immediate, and extended family who were, were very tightly knit and, and very, like, close to each other and supportive. Uh, she had a lot of emotional support from her family. Oh, you mean as a coddled? Kid. Yes, coddled. Yes, coddled mm -hmm. into weakness um, right. mm -hmm. by having a loving family. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yep. She was more or less a political centrist uh, and politically was extremely dedicated to her studies. Uh, most people who knew her will agree that she was a tremendously ambitious young woman. She got into Yale. Uh, she was offered a prestigious job at a major law firm, and she was eventually recommended for a job under Clarence Thomas at the Department of Education. So she is a poor working class girl who works very, very hard, makes good and gets a, a prestigious job early in his, her career working under Clarence Thomas at the DOE, which is like a, a big deal for her. Um, mm -hmm. Would be a big deal for anybody in her situation. Yeah. Um, and initially, she and Clarence have a good working relationship. They're very friendly. But 
with not in in not a whole lot of time, he graduates to heavy, unwanted flirtation. And I'm going to quote from Strange Justice again. Thomas began to ask her out socially three to five months after she began working for him in July 1981, according to Hill. His approach was unusual. Rather than asking her to join him for a specific date or event, like a movie or dinner, he expressed his interest as a casual command, saying, You ought to go out with me sometime. She turned him down firmly, she recalled, explaining that she enjoyed her work and believed it ill-advised to date a supervisor. But he would not take no for an answer. Instead, she testified, in the following weeks, he continued to ask me out on several occasions. He pressed me to justify my reasons for saying no to him. So that's Jesus. not, that's bad. You ought to go out with, what the, you ought to go out with me. You know, you ought to go out with me. That's it. Mm -hmm. Was he a Jedi? What the fuck is that supposed to do? Yeah, yeah this, this is this is the loins I, you're looking for, and he's and he's married at this point. Uh, no, no, he is. Uh, well, oh, he's actually, not married. When, when does he when does he get remarried? 1987. Yeah, 87. So yeah, this would have been because the, they start working in like 81. So yes, he's this is he's in between wives, I think, at this point. Okay, this is in between wives. Okay, got you, got you, got you. Yeah. Sorry, just wanted to clarify um, where, where he's at yeah, in his life. Yeah, this starts in between wives. Um, got it. So yeah, uh, that's not great. Uh, Hill later testified mm -hmm. that Thomas never threatened to fire her if she did not date him or anything like that, but that he pressured her so much that it was a po impossible for her to like do her job. Uh, he talked about Jesus. sex constantly, calling her into the office to discuss work matters and then pivoting at once to gratuitous descriptions of fucking. Uh, quote, his conversations were very vivid. He spoke of acts that he had seen in pornographic films involving such matters as women having sex with animals and films showing group sex or rape scenes. He talked about pornographic materials depicting individuals with large penises or large breasts involved in various sex acts. On various occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess, mentioning at one point that he had measured his penis, which he said was larger than most. Uh... I would say that's not a good working environment. That's not like you shouldn't Fuck. like that yeah. should probably get you in trouble anywhere. Unless you're that's, like, unless in, if you are a porn producer, that's probably appropriate work conversation. I will say that if you are in the pornographic film industry, then that's probably yeah, that's relevant, more or less normal conversation. You're, um, it's relevant. You're describing work. But yeah. In this, you're supposed to be some kind of yeah. You're the chairman of the EEOC, uh, or you're you're working at the uh, Department of Education. Neither of those are places. I would say that that's a appropriate conversation. This is like when you know, like shit's so bad too. Where it's yeah, to any person, you're like that. You know, you no, that if, no, if, you should no, you wouldn't if you were fucking driving with a friend on a road trip and they started having this conversation. Like, you would probably be like, hey, this has to stop. Like, this is not, I don't want to talk with you about this. Like, what? I'm not, again, very pro porn here, not a prude here. But no, if, no, of like, course. somebody, if again, if my boss calls me into his office and is like, you know, I was watching a video of a woman having sex with an animal. Let me tell you Wait, about what? how the horse's penis, okay, what I, what I, I saw go. it doing when it displaced her belly. And like, Look, that's like. Jack, I got to write these cracked articles, man. You got to give mm -hmm. me time. So, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, I gotta wow. Wow. <laughs> wow, Miles. No comment. That's, 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 that's a, uh, wow. Uh, uh, Miles Gray's last appearance on podcasting, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like bad i think it's fair to say bad uh also describing your own penis that's really no, definitely a clear line you shouldn't shouldn't do that to your co-workers um now when these allegations came out during the confirmation process thomas mm. took an interesting approach to handling them right so he'll she only spends like a day being questioned but like now this comes out and it becomes there's this huge media thing about it uh people are making a big deal about which they should i'm not saying they're making a big deal about it like it's bad to this is a problem um mm -hmm. thomas takes an interesting res approach to responding to it now the smart play might have been to apologize for making her feel uncomfortable right or to say like i'm sorry you know i was joking i'm sorry that my jokes made now, i'm not saying that's good I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that would make it okay. I'm saying that might be the smart play as like a 
guy trying to get out of trouble is, is being like not at least deny shit. I, I you know this is a you know I have this I've spent a lot of time working around a lot of guys you know it's a you know we 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 make these jokes all the time and I was just making jokes with her like I would with any colleague and I'm sorry that I it made her feel uncomfortable right like that right. that would be probably what most men in his position would do um again that's bad but i'm saying that like that's the uh, that's the normal that, that would be the move, yeah yeah right? right our societal flow of events yeah. typically is like that he doesn't do that instead he denies ever speaking to her about sex at all and he also denies ever having similar conversations with in the workplace at any point in time now this is an obvious lie Virtually every close coworker and colleague of Clarence Thomas has experiences, which they later told to press many under their own names of him talking about pornography and making weirdly explicit sex jokes. This is a constant experience. People right. who are friends with him and who worked with him have had over the course of decades. Multiple women who have worked with Thomas over the years have recounted identical experiences. Now, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail about Professor Hill. She later becomes a professor. Now she's Professor Hill. Um, I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail about her allegations other than to say that they are very credible and they are backed up by the recollections of multiple people that she discussed Thomas's behavior with at the time and also the experience of like several dozen people who knew him socially and professionally in the years before he was nominated to the Supreme Court. What I will do is recount for you one more anecdote to make a point of how relentless his inappropriate sexual behavior at work truly was. And here's Meyer and Abramson again. And Abramson again. Quote, one of the oddest of Hill's recollections was that one day when she and Thomas were working in his office, he got up from the table where he had been sitting with her, went over to his desk to retrieve a can of Coca-Cola, and after staring at it, demanded to know, who has put pubic hair on my Coke? I didn't have a clue how to interpret that, Hill testified. I did not know. It was a strange comment for me. I thought it was inappropriate, but I did not know what he meant. In the hearings, Thomas sounded equally baffled and offended by such language. Asked by Senator Orrin Hatch if he had ever said such a thing, Thomas replied, no, absolutely not. Now, Miles, that's horseshit. And we know it's horseshit because Meyer and Abramson, being good reporters, went and talked to a bunch of his co-workers and were like, you ever make any comments about like a Coke and a pubic hair to you? And boy, howdy, do a lot of people have the exact same experience yeah. Anita Hill did. This is like a thing for him. Quote. Oh, so this. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. Just just let me let me get this through and then we could talk yeah. about it. Miles. No. Quote. No. Marguerite Donnelly, a senior trial attorney at the EEOC until she went into private practice in 1986, distinctly recalled being told by a co-worker in the early 1980s that Chairman Thomas had said, and I thought it was in the presence of several people, that there was a pubic hair on his can of Coke. Donnelly says she told her husband, Alan Danoff, who was an attorney at the EEOC until 1985, about the peculiar comment. When interviewed, Danoff confirmed this. We certainly did hear about it back then, he said. Thomas's aide, Michael Middleton, also said that he heard about the, he heard the pubic hair story associated with Thomas before 1985, when he too left the EEOC. I have this vision of Clarence at the EEOC picking up a Coke and saying, who put this pubic hair on my Coke, recalled Middleton, formerly Thomas's principal deputy at the Department of Education and associate general counsel at the EEOC, and now a professor at law at University of Mi Missouri, Columbia. Middleton also remembered telling his wife about it at the time. During the hearings, he said he turned to her and asked if she remembered the story, and she told him that she did. So, like... <sighs> That's a lot of people to know about you, like picking up yeah. cokes in the office and being like, "Why is there a pube on this coke?" Like, that's a lot of people who have had that. Who who are like, "Oh yeah, that's a thing Clarence does." A stupid fucking thing to also be known for. It's a really stupid thing to be known for. A really we're, stupid, creepy thing to be known for. Yeah, and we're again throughout all these episodes, right? I'm just like we're putting together this backstory of a person who now is one of the most. Has most some of the in, most one of the most powerful power. people on the planet. Yes, and is can skull fuck the earth, people's mm -hmm. rights, whatever sure the fuck they want, with just because because of their fucking shitty road here, and also somebody who's also been afforded like some of the worst parts of like you know society, like benefiting from oh yeah, just all kinds of shit that also gives him this like terrible sense of potency and like righteousness and shit and, and all of it's coming together to <laughs> like we're just watching it all play out now yeah it really it's good. is kind of alarming it just feels like the most 
Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no. I, I <laughs> would say, here, and here's what I would say, that it's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's the end of the episode. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, whomst, whomst among us, right, has not, you know, everybody's coworkers have stories about them. For example, some of us might have mm-hmm. a history of, you know, sneaking into people's houses at night and rubbing various poisonous plants on, on children's clothing in order to make kids right. tougher, right? Like, nobody's perfect, right. but... uh right. Yeah, or maybe we're not you all sell trying to be Supreme a bunch Court of justices. jailbroken Amazon Fire Sticks. Sure, of course. Who Etsy. hasn't done that, right? Or offer up that yeah. you can honestly, bro. For one fifty, you'll get all the channels. You'll get access to this one Plex server. It's that a real deal. Already has mm-hmm. Wakanda forever on it. Full. And I'm, he's not. Anyway. Here's the thing about Miles is being very humble. Here's the thing he's not going to say about these hundred and fifty dollar Fire Sticks that he's selling. Yeah. They absolutely will not steal your data so that people well, can no. can can make paypal payments on that's your behalf that's not what i'm here for to their that's own not, account I'm here, absolutely not I just, won't happen i just i'm only here for the first transaction i'm here to swipe your data and of IP course information not. Of because course you have to connect not. it to your of wi-fi of course not just like clarence thomas isn't getting on the supreme court in order to destroy a woman's right to choose he's not going to do that he doesn't even think about that kind of law he, he didn't even think about it how would never he would never think about it, it. Every, he didn't even know about it <laughs> Um, anyway, Clarence Thomas gets confirmed by the narrowest margins of any Supreme Court justice in history up to that point. Uh, I think still to this day, maybe Kavanaugh beat him. I didn't check on that. I should have. I would have if I wasn't a hack and a fraud, but he gets confirmed, right? That's all that matters. It's mm-hmm. like the thing that people say about like, what do you call the, the doctor who ranked last in medical class? Doctor? Like, he's right. still, he's on the fucking Supreme Court. Doesn't Sorry. matter that it was narrow. Mad. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it is worth noting that when Hill told the Senate Judiciary Committee about what Thomas had done, Senator Joe Biden insisted her name not be used and that Thomas not be told of the allegations, which seriously limited the Senate committee's options in terms of actually doing anything about this. Joe has been accused of kind of acting to hush it up. Um, Weird. Joe. Mm. Good thing that guy doesn't come up later in the story. Anyway, an FBI investigation was suggested, and it was determined that Thomas had done nothing wrong. Uh, So they look into it for like a couple of days, and they're like, it's fine. He didn't do anything weird. And I guess legally, none of this is really illegal, especially since he helped change the definition of what sexual harassment in the workplace was. Right, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yet. So that's cool. Uh, Anita Hill gets absolutely savaged by right-wing media. Very few people who have been like more brutally attacked by the right than her. Um, And yeah, it's, it's, it's a gnarly period of time. Although at this point, a majority of Americans when polled say they believe her side of the story. I'm I'm calling it that not because I think there's actually sides to this, but you know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. She's been vindicated. And in addition to the fact that other allegations against Thomas have come out in the years since, like she's been extremely vindicated. Uh, Professor Hill, you know, Seems to have 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 done her best, and uh, I I have nothing but the best wishes for her. Anyway, at this point, uh, she has been backed up repeatedly by allegations made by multiple women and the re- recollections of numerous colleagues. Thomas, for his part, has spent the remainder of his life since then enraged at liberals for questioning his honor and damaging his reputation. Mm-hmm. There are claims that he promised to make their lives absolute hell in revenge for what had been done. Whatever the truth, Thomas lost no time in being the worst judge he could possibly be. And I'm going to quote from the New Yorker here. In the 1995 case, Missouri versus Jenkins, the court's conservative majority held that federal courts could not force Missouri to adopt policies designed to entice suburban white students to predominantly black urban schools. Thomas joined the majority. In the court's private deliberations about the case, he argued, in the paraphrase of a profile of Thomas in the New Yorker, I am the only one at this table who has attended a segregated school. And the problem with segregation was not that we didn't have white people in our class. The problem was that we didn't have equal facilities. We didn't have heating. We didn't have books. And we had rickety chairs. All my classmates and I wanted was the choice to attend a mostly black or mostly white school and to have the same resources in whatever school we choose. This private sentiment made its way into Thomas's public statement about the case. His concurrence in Missouri v. Jenkins was the only opinion, legal scholar Mark Graber argues, that questioned whether desegregation was a constitutional value. 
If anything, Thomas believes that the state should, where it can, within the law, support the separation of the races. Looking back on his education in an all-black environment, Thomas has admitted to wanting to turn back the clock to a time when we had our own schools. Much of his jurisprudence is devoted to undoing the grand experiment, which he believes himself to be a victim of. As he made clear in 1986, I have been the guinea pig for many social experiments on social minorities. To all who would continue these experiments, I say, please, no more. Oh my god, when we had our yeah. own schools, what a... He's literally saying separate but equal is fine. What a fucking backwards... I mean, yeah, everything's back. Yeah, going back in time, yeah. man. What a yeah. charitable description. When we had yeah. our own schools. When we had our own schools. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good that he's on the Supreme Court. But you know what else is good, Miles? Hmm goods and services yeah the products and services that support this podcast you know including and a lot of people don't know this uh but we are we are supported by the segregation industry um so hop on down not even funny i sophie what do you what do you want <laughs> what do you want here i have to do so many ad pivots I it's know. a bigger picture thing i guess he's saying yeah is, what the, is it now you're talking about right i am talking about yes is primarily uh, spends all up it puts its profits into supporting uh, a return to segregation laws for sure. Sophie, are we allowed to make that claim about? No. Okay. Nah. Well, doesn't a barrage you with fucking trailers that play even when you don't ask them to, <laughs> and so if you make the mistake of ever clicking on your 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 computer and TV are, you are just saying gonna the scream at so you at many random times so that Chris is, has to bleep everything because that's what's happening. You don't have to bleep a factual statement about a company, Sophie. And I hate what they do with their fucking auto playing. It's trailers. really fucking annoying. It's horrible. It's the <laughs> it worst. It really bothers me. It's terrible. You know, and like, that's why. Go ahead. The official iHeart Radio stance is pirate <laughs> shows. I'm sorry, Chris, for all the bleeps you have to put in. Don't bleep that part, though. Anyway, here's ads. Oh, we're back. You know, I was just engaging in my hobby, which is taking the profits we get from the catalytic converters that Miles steals and turning them into buying large numbers of flash drives which Allegedly. I then put torrented copies of the show Stranger Things on, and I just leave them lying around town in a variety of places. Um, I don't watch the show. Haven't ever seen it. Don't don't intend to. That's just not, like that to is help other people pirate not it. True. I you have ranted to me. You you and Hanrahan have both have opinions on this show. Well, okay, I watched season one, yeah. but I pirated the others and I hand them out to people. You know why I do that, Sophie? Because you're one time. I was having a conversation with somebody and was trying to put on a show that was on and screamed at me so loud that I felt momentarily uncomfortable. And as a result, I am going to war against them. That's wild because earlier you, when I said something you didn't like, mm -hmm. you said, you are like Papa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what that joke means. I love that joke, Miles. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Robert, continue with all the, the borking that needs to be done with the rest of the script. Yeah, bork out with your corks out, everybody. So, <laughs> sit, yeah. Um, anyway, that's Clarence Thomas, uh, anti-integration, separate but equal pro guy. This pisses off a lot of people. Rosa Parks goes after him. Um, she says at the oh time, quote, he has had all the advantages of affirmative action and he went against it. Um, if you've pissed off Rosa Parks, you're probably bad. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Like, Th also, that would be didn't like, <laughs> what? didn't the owner of Little Caesars like pay for her house? Yes, I did hear that. Yes, and yeah, Little Caesars. I always think it, it's one so of the funny. Better and because of that, what's fucked up is that's good marketing. Because now when I think of Rosa Parks, I think of Little Caesars, and I feel bad about that. But I like Crazy Bread. I, it, they, their Crazy the Bread is pretty slurred. good. But I have yeah. to say, like, if I think about like the things that would make me feel like a dog shit person. Having Rosa Parks talk shit about me, like that's oh hard. Oh my god! If you have any kind and, of shame, right. that's that's a hard one to live well, down. It's not like it's not like Rosa Parks is doing like a fucking daily fucking live stream no, show, or no. you, she's gonna have takes on everything. It's like, yo, she had to come off the bench, yeah, to fucking suit up for this take, yeah, and that says a lot, yeah. So 
In The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, Corey Robin makes the case that, over the course of his time in power, Thomas has arrived at a fairly consistent set of beliefs about the Constitution. His Constitution, the one that he believes in, is not the Constitution as it presently like exists, uh, or even the one that he really rules on, but it's actually two separate documents. There's the original Constitution, which is the Constitution as it existed at the founding of the United States, and then there is the Black Constitution, which is the one that existed after the Civil War and the Reconstruction construction amendments that bought, brought black people into the country as, on paper, equal citizens. Quote, Thomas's black constitution looks nothing like that progressive enterprise. Far from making the United States racially egalitarian and humane, far from creating a multiracial democracy, the black constitution features a society that is violent, racist, and regressive, a mix of Mad Max and do the right thing. The centerpiece of that constitution is the Second Amendment, reinterpreted via the 14th Amendment as applying not just to the federal government, but also to the states. The individual's right to bear arms is what Thomas sees as the black man's main protection against a rampage white supremacy, the critical right that the new constitutional order provides. There are no cooperative institutions of racial equality and democratic mutuality in Thomas's political vision. There are no union leagues, no Freedmen's Bureau, no interracial politics and parties. There is only the defiant black man, reliant upon his constitutional right to arm himself and defend his family against white marauders. For Thomas, the broadened Second Amendment, with its attendant vision of a racialized society armed to the teeth, is the keystone of the Constitution constitutional transformation that emancipation has wrought. Now, that might seem like a bleak vision of the country to you. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I who find is... that kind of negative um, in a yeah. lot of ways. I find that negative as a guy who's like pretty supportive of the right to bear arms. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, I mean, it's like maybe it's like uh, mutually assured destruction or something. There some should shit, be no like... civil rights other than the right to shoot each other. Um, that's and that's all I gotta say about that. Yeah, it's like, that's and who not you, ideal. Which people do you live with in this yeah. world, Clarence? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, obviously, Thomas is very popular on the far right. A former U.S. attorney under George W. Bush, who helped write one of Thomas's recent memoirs, called him the quote "greatest living American," which is a title you can find in a bunch of Fox News and other right wing articles about him. Uh, they 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 love calling him that. Uh, but his support of the Second Amendment isn't, Robin argues, based on support for the kind of oath keeper, proud boy style militias popular on the fascist right today. Quote, when white conservatives think of the white to bear arms, they imagine sturdy white colonials firing their muskets at red coats and then mustering in militias or modern day whites guarding their doorways against government tyranny and black criminals. Thomas sees black slaves arming themselves against their masters, black freedmen defending their rights against white terrorists and black men protecting their families from a residual and regnant white supremacy. Thomas's McDonald opinion returns repeatedly to scenes of white terror and black revolt. No other justice in McDonald devoted nearly as much attention to the violence of the black struggle against slavery and the violence of the white struggle to restore slavery. And this is, again, why Thomas sees the second as speaking to an individual right and why he's also consistently against bans of cate uh, on categories of weapons like handguns or assault weapons. Uh, this is interesting because it showcases one of the many ways in which Thomas is kind of inconsistent. In his Second Amendment jurisprudence in particular, Thomas has shown a particular willingness to slash through state laws he sees as violating elements of the black constitution. But Thomas is also a believer in the white constitution, which he sees as flawed but possessing valuable characteristics, particularly particularly the tendency to devolve power back to the states. Robin makes a note of Thomas's opinion in 2015's Broomfeld v. Kane as particularly enlightening here. The case was about whether prisoners with intellectual disabilities should be disqualified from receiving the death penalty. The murderer in this case, Kevin Broomfeld, had been abandoned by his father as a child and eventually murdered a police officer during a robbery. In his decision, Thomas contrasted Broomfield's case with the murder victim's son, Warwick Dunn, who was also abandoned by his father. Dunn's mom was killed when he was 18, and he successfully raised his five younger brothers and sisters while earning a position in the NFL. Thomas noted that Dunn, quote, did not use the absence of a father figure as a justification for murder. Now, obviously, this story is potent father for a lot of, fodder for a lot of think pieces, but many people at the time noted that it was kind of weird for Thomas to spend so much time on it during his, like, judgment on the case, because it has nothing to do with the actual murder. 
itself. Um, and it's kind of weird for him to use that platform to randomly contrast two black men when the case is about whether or not Broomfield's sentence is just. Justice Alito was so weirded out by this but that even though he agreed with Clarence Thomas on the broad strokes, he wrote a separate dissent in order to avoid including this th- tangent in his argument. Because he was like, I don't know, man, that's kind of fucking weird. <laughs> uh, yo, what? Yeah. Like, yeah. Even Scalia's like, dude, I'm, I'm sorry. I wonder because, yeah, if Clarence Thomas again, like, you know, like you said, it's chaos in his mind. And then he just suddenly, uh, like, reflexively just was like, and the difference between these two black men. Yeah. Is that one of them. Yeah. Excuse me. That's not what we're talking about, Clarence. Yeah. Um, Oh, uh, yeah. uh, Right. And and Corey Robbins book makes clear that the rest of Thomas's descent is just as bug fuck. Quote. For Thomas, however, it was indeed essential to the legal analysis. At the heart of his white constitution is a vision of two different kinds of black men, one who wills himself to become a patriarch and another who wastes life, his own and others, in the absence of that patriarch. The liberal state, Thomas believes, would protect the second. His white constitution would help to produce the first. Dunn's example notwithstanding, the actively involved father is mostly a fantasy figure in Thomas's jurisprudence, a stern man of no particular racial identity. Thomas's patriarch once helmed the Republic, instructing chastising and punishing his children in the interest of their development as moral beings and good citizens. In the beginning, Thomas proposes in one opinion, fathers ruled families with absolute authority. That authority was critical to the moral health of the nation, for it fostered children who learned the virtues and values of the republic. And despite changes in the polity and parenting styles over the years, Thomas says, people still believe that parents, Thomas alternatively depicts the authority figure as paternal and parental, have authority over their children. The father is the head of the household, Thomas writes in another opinion, quoting from an earlier precedent, and has the responsibility and the authority for the discipline, training, and control of his children. That authority is based on the societal understanding of superior and inferior. In cases about the rights of minors, Thomas freely drops phrases like the continued subjection to the parental will and total parental control over children's lives. He's So I don't like that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, again, you, he's like also like making this like dad that he thinks he wishes he had too. Yeah, like, you know that what he I mean? pretends like, his grandpa was when he's talking to the right, but that really was just absent from his life. Yes, right. And then trying to like then shape a society where like this dad exists. That yeah, he like idealizes too. We're, it's so we're fucked. We're all like, missing a dictator dad, which is like this is Thomas didn't invent this concept. You know, right, in, right. in Rome, they called the 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 head of the house, the head of the family, which was generally like the oldest man, right? If like even if you were a kid, your grandfather would be this, the pater familias, right? Right. And you had the right as the father to execute your children at any time. Like that was like a thing in Roman law during the Republic. It's like if you're dad, you can kill your kids. Like you have that right that that you have absolute. Oh shit! Power. He was. Oh, he talked back to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, for sure. You didn't hear about it being done a whole lot, but like you have that right that was considered like the sacred right of not not a parent, but a father. Um, Of course. And like, yeah, there's even like in Rome, there was this kind of attitude that like you're not really an adult as long as your dad is still around. Um, There was a whole lot of weird shit with fathers there. But like this goes back to if you look at fucking German society, there was very Mm. much this idea that the Kaiser is the father of the nation. And likewise, mm. the father should be the dictator of his family, the the unquestioned regent, right? The Kaiser is this king that nobody can 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 counter or question, and the father should be of the family, the same thing. And this is a big part of why the Nazis do so well in Germany later, right? Like, there's a lot of... Right. Yeah. They're all in line with the idea. Yeah. So, t- Thomas is very much, like, speaking as part of a tradition of attitudes towards what the rights of a father should be. Mm. Um, he just has decided that that's the core of what America and American law ought to be and what the founders, all, all sorts of all sorts of good shit. Even though you could also look at the entire birth of this country as like the history of a child rebelling from its parent, but whatever. Like, well, there's no yeah. point in arguing this sort of thing. Um, so 
For the first like 20 years that this guy's on the bench, there is a tendency among liberal critics to reduce Thomas to Justice Scalia's shadow. Now, this is due to his reputation as the silent justice. Again, he never speaks for years. He doesn't say a single word during oral arguments. There's like a 10-year period where he never speaks during oral arguments. Um, and while it's true that he does rule kind of the same way as Justice Scalia on about 85% of cases while they're both alive, this is not really that exceptional or unusual. During the same period of time, Justice Bryant Breyer agreed with Justice Kagan 95% of the time, which nobody ever, like, talks about. Mm -hmm. um, the claims that he was somehow copying Scalia were likely based in racism. And in fact, people say the same thing about Thurgood Marshall. And one of the, there's a white justice whose name I'm forgetting that was friends with Marshall that are like, oh, Marshall just does the same thing as his friend. You know, like, right. really, this, these, these are, I think both of these He's claims are in his homework. Yeah, based on some racism. Um, the extant evidence suggests that Thomas really just did truly respect Scalia's ideas and jurisprudence. Uh, sc since Scalia's death, Thomas has spoken more often in court and has repeatedly cited non-judicial writings by his friend in his rulings. I found a write-up in Politico by Professor Richard Primus of some law school or another, which makes the case that Thomas now basically uses Scalia the way that he uses the founders, as a malleable ideological tool to reinforce whatever point he already wanted to make. Quote, much of the time, Thomas will surely deploy Scalia in the name of a cause that Scalia would have endorsed himself. The two of them did agree on an awful lot, after all, but they were all also always different in the extent and flexibility of their originalism, in the degree of their skepticism towards federal power, and in other ways as well. In the future, Scalia may be molded to Thomas's own vision, and the longer Thomas serves, the more the court's agenda will move beyond issues that Scalia directly confronted, thus giving Thomas even more freedom, whether by design or just by doing what comes naturally to him, to shape perceptions of what Scalia would have done hmm. so that's interesting yeah now it's yeah that's it's like it's like what uh puff daddy does with, mm -hmm. with biggie he's like you know it's, my, it's my, very my, puff daddy and yeah my homeboy biggie you know he's dead but y'all respect the idea the concept of it yeah uh, and just want to deploy that for my own purposes i don't know i I, I, I have often called uh uh justice scalia the biggie smalls of the supreme court right um and Clarence Thomas is Puff Daddy. Mm -hmm. and absolutely. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And Sandra Day O'Connor, Aesop Rock. Not going to explain that one. Just moving okay. right along. Okay? Not so, <clears throat> I'm not going to spend any more time laboring on Thomas's jurisprudence or the cases that he's ruled on. This is one of those things where, like, the worst of what he's done and is doing is actually pretty obvious to most people because it's right. happening constantly. So we, mm -hmm. we all spend enough time dealing with that. Mostly I wanted to explain his background, where he came from, what's going on intellectually, and, like, what are his internal justifications for the things that he's doing when he tears rights away from people and forces his weird, demented views on the populace, uh, which he will continue to do until something is done to take that power away from him. Um so instead of going more into just like a list of his rulings on Supreme Court cases, I think we should close by talking about Jenny Thomas. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You excited for this, Miles? Feeling good? I mean, you know, behind every great porn. That's right. Obsessed Supreme Court justice. I'd love to hear is an equally obsessed uh, porn obsessed mm -hmm. person, but I don't yes. know. I'm, I'm, let's take a look, please. I mean, all I yeah. know is obviously the latest, uh, yeah. the reasons she's been popping in the news, but I definitely, I could, I could know a lot more about Jenny Thomas. You're about to. So, Clarence met Virginia Lamp in early 1987. She was a lawyer from Nebraska, and early on in their marriage, uh, she tended to be described as Clarence's opposite. Mayor and Abramson talk about her taking homeless strangers out to lunch and describe her sweet naivete. Um, when they two first met, she worked for the Chamber of Commerce, where she was the Reagan administration's spokesperson against family leave and comparable worth, a.k.a. <laughs> paying women for equal work equally, right? That's oh Virginia my. Lamp is like, women shouldn't be getting equal pay. Maternity leave for what? Yeah. She's they need doing, to be working if they're going to be good mothers and set examples for their kids. She's doing um, the, the equal pay equivalent of... Uh, supporting fucking apartheid South Africa as right, like exactly. a prominent black guy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so she's cool. That's good. Uh, Lamp is obviously very far right. And at one point she was close to joining a cult, a group that was basically a cult. And I'm going to quote from strange justice here. Cause this is a fun little side story. Miles. 
Lamp was, if anything, more conservative than Thomas. Her father, her family, well-connected and well-to-do, had provided the backbone of Goldwater's support in Nebraska. Her father, a developer who had built some of the most exclusive gated, gated communities outside Omaha, was a party activist, as was her mother. When Lamp decided to move to Washington, her parents helped her find her first job there, a staff position in the Senate office of Republican, of Republican Hal Daub of Nebraska. While in the Capitol, Lamp joined an assertiveness training group called LifeSpring. She became deeply involved in the group, but was troubled in 1985 when, during a life spring exercise, exercise, trainees were forced to take off all but a bikini to the tune of The Stripper. As she described the incident, participants were pelted with questions about sex and urged to ridicule fat people's bodies. I had intellectually and emotionally gotten myself so wrapped up with this group that I was moving away from my family and my friends and the people that I work with, Lamp later admitted. My best friend came to visit me as I was preach and, and I was preaching at her, using this tough attitude they teach you. Now, Strange Justice was written back in the 90s, and as a result, they don't have a lot of detail about Lifespring. Um, it's like a soft cult. It's one of those assertiveness trainings, like guru training program type deals, yeah. where you like sit around in circles and like everybody takes turns insulting one person at a time in order to like fuck everybody up together and, and bond the group through trauma. It's one of those mm -hmm. good things. One of those good oh, things. Yeah. But you don't have to live here. Mm -mm. Honestly, I have to say, this is one case where if no one had gotten her out of the cult, we'd probably be better off. Um, well, it sounds like she found, sounds like she's pretty malleable. That old yes. brain is pretty malleable. Yeah. Uh, in 1979, a Seattle woman with asthma died after a LifeSpring trainer told her that she didn't need to take her medicine anymore. Uh, in 1982, oh, a Seattle shit. man's family sued LifeSpring for convincing him that he was both Jesus Christ and the devil. So this is a cool group. Um... Wow. So Lamp, Lamp does get out of Life Spring, uh, okay. sadly. And one of the first things that she finds after leaving this cult is Clarence Thomas, uh, who she meets at an ADL event about civil rights. So that's good. Uh, From the cult right to Clarence. Uh, he gives her a ride home, and in pretty short order, the two were boning. Or I'm assuming they're boning. They're at least a romantic item. One has to assume the boning follows. Uh, Lamp introduced Thomas to a church, Truro Episcopal, where she went. Uh, it was a popu popular place for arch-conservative Reaganites and profoundly anti-abortion. The rector compared abortion to Holocaust on a regular basis. Over the following decades, Clarence and Jenny would have a life that often wove inappropriately between his duties as a Supreme Court justice and her career as a weirdo Republican operative. From a write-up by MSN, quote, while at Heritage, the Heritage Foundation, in 2000, Jenny Thomas gathered resumes for a possible George, v, uh, George W. Bush administration. But Clarence Thomas rebuffed all calls for him to recuse from the Bush v. Gore case that decided the, the election. Thomas cast the deciding vote in the 5-4 ruling that made Bush president. In 2011, 74 House Democrats vote, wrote to Clarence Thomas asking him to recuse from any cases involving the Affordable Care Act because of his wife's work for Heritage, which opposed the law. He declined and voted against upholding the law in 2012. She's working with the nascent Bush administration before Bush v. Gore is decided. She's trying to overturn Obamacare. She's trying to overturn the 2020 election, said Gabe Roth, executive director of Fix the Court, which advocates for a more open and accountable federal judici judiciary. It's a real Forrest Gump-type existence that none of the other previous hundred-odd Supreme Court spouses have lived. So that's good. It's good that... Jesus. Good uh... that he didn't recuse himself from Bush v. Gore. Good that she's like a consistent hardcore political activist and that that doesn't yeah. mean he has to recuse himself from anything even though like the right would absolutely scream if the same thing was happening on the left yeah right oh yeah oh well you want text messages from january 6th i don't know you know i don't know if my wife has anything to do with it whatever yeah. who gives a shit we give a fuck yes i said it, it makes so much oh i mean just to be flippant for a moment that mm -hmm. someone who's coming from like a verbal abuse cult like goes on a date with creepy Clarence with Clarence Thomas, Thomas and is and on you're board. Like, yeah, this guy's so cool. He's yeah. actually the best, th the nicest person I've ever met. Yeah, he's much better than the last cult that I was in. Um, which I don't know. Some people will argue that she's the one who's kind of leading him around. I don't know. I'm sure they both are shitty people who found each other and whose desire to hurt the world. Just Come on, coincides. can a black man just fuck up the world on his own? Yeah, exactly. I think this you know, is just a case of true love between people who want to make the world worse. You don't need to yeah. take agency away from either of them. Y you know, uh, whatever whatever is going on there is just the oh, it's unbelievably be horrible. Um, but you know, anyway. 
Ginny Thomas is now in the news because she was kind of sort of directly involved in a violent attempt to overthrow the, gov- overthrow the government and institute a dictatorship. In the days leading up to January 6th, she sent 21 messages to Mark Meadows, urging him to overturn the results. Help this great president stand firm, Mark, she wrote in one of them. In response to a November 24th text from Meadows that he was intent on fighting for Trump's victory, Jenny Thomas replied, Thank you. Needed that. This plus a conversation with my best friend just now. I will try to keep holding on. America is worth it. Now, the emails don't make clear who the best friend Jenny Thomas was referring to, although she has repeatedly called Clarence Thomas her best friend because he's her husband. Uh, Yeah, that's good. Um... That said, she denies all this publicly in an interview with the Washington Free Beacon, a right wing news site. She said, Clarence doesn't discuss his work with me and I don't involve him in my work. I'm sure Mm -hmm. that's true. There's more. More will be coming out. Probably has dropped by the time this comes out. There's like more on her and Jan six. This is all. And maybe she'll get she might get charged. Like that's not impossible at this stage, given where we are. I don't think it's likely. Um, But, you know. People are talking about it. I don't think anything's ever going to happen to Clarence Thomas other than he will continue to get his way. Uh, no. And have some so that's real good. weird conversations with people. Yep. So, uh, mm. how you feel, Miles? Um, good? Pretty weird. Um, but, you know, just, just got to keep on keeping on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> As we say. You know, Miles, what this reminds me of, this conversation mm. between you and I, mm. is a little a little thing that Jesus Christ said to his disciples mm. when he was yes. preaching, on, preaching on that mountain, Miles. Mm-hmm. And he said to them, you know, the world is full of the minions of Satan, but you know what will protect you from the minions of Satan is the precious metals held in a catalytic converter. So Thank you so much. Get one of them. Get them all. Catch them Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Got to catch them all. Jesus Christ said that. Mark Without 4, 19. Converters. That's right. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come and choke the world, making it unfruitful without catalytic converters. Okay? Wow. Wow. The word of God. <sighs> Thanks be to him. Yep. Oh, that's so sick. You get the Jesus fish, but like with catalytic converters. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, you love to okay. see it. So, had to pivot away from the darkness of our fucking judicial system. Yes. Yeah. What else are you going to do? Um, uh, so, anyway, that's uh, that's Clarence Thomas. Sick. Oh, thanks uh, for making me feel a lot better about this. Actually, I you know, that's how I feel. To. I feel a lot better about this because you got to know what you're up against. Absolutely. Um, and he. He is aware of the effect that, you know, the Dobbs decision has on, you know, uh, adult film performers, right? Uh, you know, that is interesting, because I wonder if he's, like, maybe, because his wife's super religious, she's like, I don't know, maybe there's something weird going on there, R.E., his ability to watch porn now. I don't know. I don't know what's... No fucking way. <laughs> yeah. No there's... fucking way. Maybe that's his his thing. He, he just wants a, a strong woman to tell him he's not allowed to watch porn and hit him every time he tries to. Maybe that's what gets him off. We don't know. Oof. With a rolled up newspaper. Yeah. And a bowl full of cornflakes. All right. That's well, right. Who knows? Who allegedly. Knows? Yeah. Anyway, you got any pluggables, Miles? Yeah. Just, you know, check out your local mutual aid organization. Yeah. Uh, check out your, your local time. mutual aid organization. Check out Clarence Thomas mm. in the next Supreme Court ruling that will fuck sure. up our lives. Yeah. Read up, you know, mm-hmm. really educate yourself. And yeah. Uh, yeah, at Miles of Gray, wherever mm-hmm. they have at symbols. That's right. Uh, I have a book. It's called After the Revolution. You can find it anywhere you want to. You can find it on uh, Amazon. You can find it on the AK Press website. You can find links there to a bunch of local indie book dealers where you can buy it. So go to Google AK Press After the Revolution or get it literally anywhere else. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Also, Daily Zeitgeist. Check out Daily oh, yeah. Zeitgeist. You got Daily That's the Zeitgeist. Daily Podcast. Check that out, too. That's the one. Yeah. Check mm-hmm. that out. Mad Boost. Check it out. Also, boost it. Bam! Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.